G'day, I'm Paul. Every time we publish a medium SUV review, you guys are asking us, can you do an off-road one? Show us how far they can go off-road. Well, that's what I've done today. So we have assembled all of the best-selling medium SUVs in Australia, with the exception of the MG HS. That unfortunately wasn't available and they wouldn't allow us to use a dealership car. And the Renault Colios, which unfortunately wasn't available as well. So both of those cars won't be in the video today. Now, this is gonna be a long video. So if you do wanna skip ahead to other parts of the video, you can use the time codes on the screen or if you're joining us on YouTube you can scroll down and use the chapters below now if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so I'm gonna be doing more of this sort of stuff and that's gonna tell you every single time one of these is published but let's get cracking welcome to our first test so you've arrived at your summer home and there is a muddy bog to get to the other side. Will your medium SUV get there? So what are we testing here? This is a test of ground clearance and also how well the car's gonna be able to deal with a bit of angle. So we're gonna reach about 20 degrees of lift on the side here as the cars come through. It's nice and soft down the bottom and very muddy. So it's gonna be a good test of not only the tires and how much traction they have, but exactly how the car deals when it does have that angle and how the ground clearance affects its body. When they reach the center though, this is where we're gonna test how rigid the chassis is. And what I mean by that is two diagonal tires are gonna be off the ground and two will have contact with the ground. What that does is put the chassis under stress. We're gonna then try and open and close the driver's door. Vehicles without a rigid chassis are gonna have metal on metal contact because everything is slightly out of place. So that'll be a good test to tell us how strong the vehicle is before we move on to our next section. Unfortunately, you're not home and hose just yet because you've got another bog hole here. This comes up on a bigger angle, which means we have another opportunity to scrape the underside of the car and potentially get it beached. Not fun. And it's also very soft through there as well, full of leaves. So it will really require a little bit of pace to get the car through. Once we get to this next part though, we're going to kick a wheel up in the air and reach full wheel articulation. This is gonna be the ultimate test of the traction control system and also the four wheel drive system because you only have two tires that have contact with the road. The car's then gonna figure out how to do everything else on its own accord. It's also worth pointing out that each car has a slightly different wheelbase and a slightly different weight distribution. So while their rest positions may differ a little bit, the end result should be the same. But we're not done just yet. We have one final test. Welcome to Log Mountain. Join me on a journey to the second cone up here as I struggle to find my way up and realize I'm incredibly unfit. Now, Log Mountain is going to be all about traction. And what this is going to do is really give us an idea of how the cars progress through these uneven terrains. We're also going to try and stop the cars at one point to see how well the traction control system can deal with moving it forward. The bigger SUVs that we test here, such as Land Cruiser, Discovery, we're able to stop them hit the throttle and it's able to sort itself out in terms of the electronics. It'll be interesting with the medium SUVs because they don't have things like diff locks and grunty engines like the Land Cruiser and Discovery do. So I'm looking forward to finding out how they go up here. Then what we'll do if they pass or fail the test of stopping, I'm gonna try go up with a little bit more pace just to make sure they can actually get to the very top and then they'll come straight back down. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this is a super light off-road test. It's nothing too crazy, but it's consistent and it gives us a point of comparison. I'll also call out that if the car has an off-road setting, we've picked the most suitable mode before we get started. Speaking of which, let's get cracking. Okay, it is Jeep Compass time. Now, it is worth noting this is the Trailhawk. It's trail rated, and that means that it's met Jeep's, you know, off-road standards over there in the States. They have a certain test course that cars have to be able to go through to meet uh, the trail rated standard. Now this has, it's a bit deceiving, there's a four wheel drive low button, but it's not actually a proper four wheel drive low range. All it does is it uses the car's existing gearbox and gearing to simulate low range, similar to what the Amarok does. You then have a four wheel drive lock button, which distributes 50% of torque to the front and rear. Um, so I'm gonna engage four wheel drive low. That's the most aggressive setting. You've also got then a section here for enabling four wheel drive modes. I'm gonna put that into mud. This is the most hardcore four wheel drive here in the medium SUV segment. So I am expecting this to do pretty well. All right, we'll get it through our seesaw. Come to a stop here for our door flex test, which is about there. Oh. Oh, that's, that's not good. So yeah, basically the door is, is stuck. Um, it is 
hitting metal on metal as it opens and closes. And then when it does shut, unless you slam it really hard, it sits open a little bit. So obviously when the body is in this full flex condition, and if I roll forward even a little bit more, when it's in that full flex condition, it's obviously not rigid enough and it's flexing just a little bit there, stopping that door from opening and closing properly. So yeah, pretty disappointing that the most off-road focused car here doesn't have the rigidity to, to be able to close its door properly or open it. Okay, let's move through to the next section. This actually feels like it hasn't tapped on anything. It has uh, a stack of ground clearance, so it means that it's sort of cruising through all this stuff. All right, here we go. I'll line it up now with our tire in the air. There it is, just there, we're teetering. So I'm gonna get off the brake now and just roll onto the throttle and we'll see how well it performs here. It's actually already doing a really good job. As I roll out of the brake, I can feel it already trying to move forward. I'll give it a bit of throttle now. Oh, that is effortless. That is really impressive. It just got through that without any problems. So it basically just engages the rear axle. It manages any slip on the rear axle all on its own. And look, to be honest, I would have expected it to do that anyway, being that it is trail rated. Okay, Log Mountain, let's give this a shot. Throttle feels good, very consistent. The ride's actually pretty good coming up here as well. Let's get it wedged. Okay, here we go. So it is wedged. Let's see if the electronics can sort it out. Feels like it's doing something. If I give it just a little bit of lock there. It's okay, so it's just come up with a message saying four wheel drive system temporarily unavailable, service four wheel drive system. Mm, not very good. Um, okay, so I'll go back down and I'll try going up again. Uh, this time I'll just stay in the throttle and let's see what it does, whether the four wheel drive system is actually working at the moment or not. I don't know. I have a feeling it might not be because I can feel just the front wheel slipping. Happy is all right. Let's stay in that. Okay, there we go. We made it up. So yes, momentum is key, but the electronics couldn't get it above our little ledge there. And then in addition to that, it threw up a warning message about the four-wheel drive system not working. So yeah, pretty unimpressed about that, given this is or should be the most capable four-wheel drive here that it came up with those errors. It's worth calling out as well on our way down here it has a hill descent control and that's actually doing a really good job going downhill so that is good if you do get yourself stuck it's able to manage your descent without too many dramas. Okay, so RAV4, one thing I'm going to point out is that the edge used to only be available as a petrol. So it had a drive shaft that ran down the center of the car, it activated the rear axle, and it had like a limited slip differential that worked using the brakes. This on the other hand being the hybrid, it has no drive shaft, it just has an electric motor that services the rear axle. So if anything, this should actually work the best because instead of it waiting for a command from the front and then moving a drive shaft, this just pulses an electric motor. So I'm gonna put this into the trail mode. There we go, that's active. And we will see how it goes. I'm really keen to see whether this actually stands up on its own two feet when it comes to that trail mode. Okay, I can hear the traction control working. As we move through, we're getting to our seesaw section. Go. And there it is, just there, it's teetering, so let's try that. Nice, that is very nice and strong, so a good chassis on the RAV4. Okay, moving to the next section. RAV4 is performing well so far. Okay, you can hear the traction control working. It's quite noisy, it's actually noisy in a lot of Toyota products. This one is no exception. And it is a little weird moving through here while the car is completely switched off. I'm going to kill that parking sensor. That's one thing I'm not liking so far. It only gives me a brief window to hit OK to switch it off. And it only does it temporarily. So, OK, here we go. We are going to kick that rear wheel up. OK, so we are now teetering. It's sort of just up in the air like that. I'm going to release the brake. Roll into the throttle. It does feel like it's struggling a little bit here. Oh, we're getting there, we're getting there. There it goes. 
Okay, we are through. So yeah, look, I think the all-wheel drive system being hybrid definitely helped because it meant that the electric motor at the rear could pulse quickly, but ultimately this didn't feel as confident as some of the other cars. It just took a while to do anything, and that could be a limitation due to that hybrid uh, electric motor at the rear. Log mountain time. Let's see how the RAV4 goes. Again, the engine is switched off. We're in EV mode only. Slightly disconcerting, but let's give this a shot. I'm having to use a lot of throttle to get this moving. Get it rested on our log up here. Okay, there it is there. So, let's give this a shot. I'm just going to get on the throttle and we'll just see if the car can release itself from here. It did roll back on its own there a little bit. Okay, it is just flaring up. Oh, it's so close. No, we're just producing a smoke show here. Um, so I'm going to go back now. So the electronics weren't able to sort itself out. Okay, take two. This one is a little bit more momentum just to make sure we can actually get up there. Yeah, it seems to really be struggling with the throttle. I have to kind of bury it for it to do anything. Oh, we are getting up now though, which is good. It just needs a bit of momentum. So yeah, look, electronics weren't quite clever enough to get it up there like they were in some of the other cars, but it does make it up eventually if you just go a little bit quicker. Outlander time. So this now shares a platform with the new X-Trail. So beneath the skin, it is effectively an X-Trail. So we've got some off-road settings here. I'm gonna pop it over to mud. It changes the screen there ahead of the driver. I feel like I'm sitting sort of really low to the ground here, which uh, is interesting, but we'll see how this feels when we go through. I can't kill those parking sensors. All right, we are getting there. All right, here we go for the middle section for our rigidity. Get it to teeter over for maximum flex, which is about there. No dramas at all, very rigid chassis. All right, let's move on. Let's see how it fares through here. A little bit of slip at the rear there. Okay, let's get this set up for a little bit of rear wheel in the air action. All right, here we go. It's just there, so we are teetering at the moment. So I'm gonna let go of the brake and roll onto the throttle. Yeah, it's kind of not doing a whole lot there. We're getting parking sensors. Yeah, look, we got there. It was just struggling a fair bit. It felt like it was spinning the, rear, the wheels in the rear rather. So yeah, look, it was pretty weak there in terms of the mogul and it didn't feel like it performed all that strongly. Okay, it's time to climb the mountain of logs. Yeah, the throttle is very flary. So as you push it on, it sort of, it just comes up a lot. And the parking sensor thing is annoying because every time it comes up, I hit disable and it, it just kind of stays on. So, all right, let's give this a shot here. I'm just gonna go straight for the throttle. We'll see what happens. Harder on the throttle. Interesting, it's doing something. It's we're just not getting the progression. Oh, it's, it's just there it is. All right. <laughs> All righty, we got there. It was actually really impressive. It wasn't doing what a lot of them do, which is just flare up and give us wheel spin. It also didn't throw up a four wheel drive error warning either. So that's actually really impressive. It eventually got up there on its own accord. And if I did that again with a bit more momentum, it would get up pretty easily. Um, the only negative I would say is just the parking sensor thing. You can disable those, but it's just annoying having to keep doing it. Um, and the other thing I'll call out as well is the suspension just feels a little bit, yeah, just a little bit funny when you're coming up. You don't get a great deal of feel through the body, but Hill Descent Control works in reverse. It's letting us down pretty easily. So yeah, good job Outlander. Okay, Forrester time. So this has like a, it's called X mode. I'm gonna put it into mud. Uh, Forrester is permanent all wheel drive and the old one or one of the older generations used to have a low range transfer case. So this should actually do okay here despite it not being sort of Jeep levels of off-road capable, but we'll see how we go. So dropped it into our bog hole here. Tiny bit of a slip there as it pulls through. 
All right, here we go. We're getting to our seesaw section and we'll test our door rigidity here. So it's about there that we're teetering. So let's try that. Awesome. That door opens and closes perfectly fine. I'll come forward a touch more. Yeah, no dramas there. So very rigid chassis in the Forester. Okay, let's go to our next section here. So this is the deeper bog hole as we roll through and I try not to destroy <laughs> Eagle's GoPro. Now we'll line it up at this next section. We'll get that wheel into the air now. So there it is, just there. So we are teetering at the moment. It's literally balancing on here. So I'm gonna roll out of the brake and roll onto the throttle. I can hear it doing stuff. Traction control light is flashing. Jeez, that is so impressive. It is really fuss free. So just a light bit of throttle and it just gets out of there. So. Yeah, really impressed there with the Forester on that little section. Okay, Log Mountain, meet Subaru Forester. So I'm gonna go into dirt mode for X mode. I think that's probably the best thing to do here. And we'll get to our resting log just up here. Just about there. All right, so now I'm just gonna plant it. We'll see what it does in terms of the electronics. Oh. That is so good. That is really impressive. I mean, that was seriously effort effortless. So um, yeah, awesome job with the Forester. So Sportage, now it has an off-road mode. So it's called Terrain, you hit that button there. We'll switch it down to Mud for this. It's done its thing, it's engaged hill descent control, but it looks like traction control is still on. So let's see how it goes. Low, <laughs> to say the least. All right, we'll get it over to our middle section. Test the rigidity of this. I do love these cameras. I'm able to see quite a lot out the front there and I can see exactly where I'm meant to be going. Okay, there it is there, teetering. So let's do doors. That feels good. It's opening and closing without any dramas at all. So let's move on. No scrapes so far. Well, no significant scrapes anyway. Um, feeling good so far. A little touch down there. Right, we'll get that wheel up in the air. We'll see what happens. Okay, it's just there. We're teetering. Um, okay, off the brake and I'll roll onto the throttle. Here we go. Waiting with bated breath. Traction control is kicking in. I'm applying more throttle. Okay, cool. It, it did get there in the end, but it did struggle. Well, it struggled. Yeah, I don't know. It just, it felt like traction control was doing its thing to a degree, but it probably would have stopped working at some point there. So one of the big advantages of the Sportage and the Tucson in diesel trim is they come with a torque converter and not a dual clutch. But yeah, ultimately I felt like it was struggling to actually utilize its traction control to get it through. So this felt like it, it had to work the hardest to get us out of that situation. Okay, Log Mountain. Let's give this a shot, the ride feels good. <laughs> That's one bonus. Oh, wow. I can't even make it over the, the first one. All right, um, uh, let's get it up to our rest point, which is just there. All right, so yeah, it struggled a little bit straight out of the box there. So we're on our rest point. I've got it in that terrain mode. Let's see what happens. As I apply throttle. No, anyway, we're not getting anywhere and it's just come up with an error message, check all wheel drive slash four wheel drive. So I'm gonna go back down the hill now. Once that error clears, I will try it once more. This time with a bit more momentum, but it really didn't feel like it was progressing at all going up there. So, all right, we'll give this one more shot. A little bit more momentum this time, just to make sure it can actually get to the top. All right, getting there. All right, with a bit of momentum, we did get there, but yeah, as you can see, it basically threw its hands up in the air when it started struggling. It didn't really feel like the traction control was doing anything to get us up that incline. So yeah, a little disappointing. It does have hill descent control, but it doesn't work in reverse. <laughs> it doesn't appear to. It's the 
car flies down the hill. Yeah, uh, definitely not made for off-roading, I don't think. So Tucson time. Now this shares a platform with the Kia Sportage. So in theory, they should do the same through here. So I'm gonna put this into terrain and then mud. Let's see how we go. That's a benefit with shared platforms. You know, if it's gonna work on one, it'll work on the other. So here we go through here. This all feels pretty good so far. Terrain mode also puts the hill descent control on. Okay, we're in our center section. Let's test that door flex. Get it to Tita, which is just there. We're at full flex. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, I thought it may have been grabbing there, but um, it's okay. Uh, so yes, pass on the door flex test. On to the next section. Let's move on through our puddle. It is super muddy. Every time we go through this with a car, it is chopping it up nicely, but no complaints so far. They seem to be progressing through without too many dramas. All right, time for our little swing up of that wheel here. Okay, here we go. All right, we have that wheel in the air. So what I'm gonna do now is let off the brake and roll onto the throttle. I can hear it doing stuff. I can feel it grabbing gradually. I'm applying more and more throttle. Yeah, it's getting there. It's it's just not all that confidence inspiring. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. So it's going through, but it really needs a lot of throttle application to get it spun up. It seems only then that it starts applying the brakes to the wheels. So yeah, it doesn't feel all that confidence inspiring compared to some of the other cars we've tested. Log Mountain, beautiful this time of year, especially when it is a little damp. All right, we'll get past our first one, which is just there. And we'll sit it here. So let's go for the throttle. We'll see what happens. We're in the terrain mode. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, traction control light is flashing, but it doesn't really feel like it's doing anything. Oh, here we go. All right, we got there. Excellent, all right, we've made it up. Yeah, right at the end there, it started to get the traction that it needed and it squirreled its way up. So yeah, really impressive. At the start, it didn't really feel like it was gonna get there, but as it gradually worked its way up, it really started to sort itself out and it got there. So it's fascinating. They must have really conditioned it for this type of thing to get it there because uh, ultimately it should, in theory, have been pretty poor when you look at how it did on the moguls. So um, we'll work our way back down here. It has a hill descent control, but doesn't appear to work in reverse. I'm noticing as well something that is really unnerving. The brake pedal is occasionally going, yeah, like right now, it has gone completely hard and I'm having to force my foot onto the brake uh, like really hard to override the assistance there to stop it. So yeah, it's not really confidence inspiring and not overly impressive when you have to manhandle the brake pedal when really it should just be gradual and progressive. CX-5, now this actually has an off-road mode, so I've got that engaged down there. Uh, according to Mazda, this forces the rear axle to act as a limited slip differential slash differential lock. So we'll see how well that works. I do like that the camera is giving us some great vision down the front there so I can see exactly what's going on. This is probably the most compact of the midsize SUV, so I am concerned about clearance and it actually kind of just getting through this stuff, but let's see how it goes right now. Uh, sideways section. All right, here we go with our door test. Let's get that on its little teetering spot, which is about there somewhere. No dramas at all. That opens and closes just like it does on flat ground, which is good. Okay, let's move on to our other seesaw. This always feels unnerving as you drive through because you're on such an angle. You feel like you're about to fall out of the car. Um, okay, so let's get this wheel up in the air. Now, there it is, just there, it's teetering. So foot off the brake, let's see how that goes. A bit of throttle, that's so cool. It actually feels like it's, ah, oh, that is awesome. It actually genuinely feels like there's a rear diff lock working and you can actually hear the traction control system 
uh, kind of firing to, to stop it all from turning at the end there. So yes, in essence, this is actually doing what it says on the box when it is in that off-road mode. It is mimicking a limited slip deer for or a rear differential lock to ensure that you are getting momentum. So yeah, it's quite an aggressive system. It seems to work well. Uh, I'm keen to see how it goes on the logs. Long mountain time for the CX-5 in off-road mode. Let's see how it fares. The ride's nice. Feels very soft and subtle up here. All right, rest it just there. All right, let's test out this system. Let's throttle on. A little bit of lock. All right, got my foot flat to the floor here, but like we're going to get there. Oh, no, I'm going to give up. No, no luck. Uh, we didn't quite make it there. It kind of felt like it was about to get there, but we didn't get there. So it's come up with an error there saying four-wheel drive system high load. It's not an error message in the sense that it's preventing all drive system from working, but it has called out that it is under load. So I'm going to try that once more, this time with a bit more momentum. We'll see how well it goes. Okay, that's off. And then on again, let's try this once more. A bit more momentum. It's getting up here with momentum. So yeah, a little disappointing there. So it overheated the four-wheel drive system and then it failed to, to basically let us go again until we stopped the car and restarted it again. So yeah, look, the off-road system worked well on our moguls, but yeah, for the logs, it didn't seem to make that much of a big difference in terms of it getting up. Almost got there, but just didn't make it. So escape, uh, let me put this into its off-road mode. So there's uh, sport, slippery and deep snow slash sand. I think that's probably the most sensible mode to use here. Give this a shot. This is the one I'm probably most concerned about making it. Um, I have a feeling it will just bottom out because it doesn't have a great deal of clearance. So we'll bring that through to our teeter position. There it is, just there. Okay. Door opens and closes without any drivers. So from a rigidity point of view, it is all good. Uh, let's progress on. This is the section it's probably gonna have the most difficulty with just because the ridges are quite pronounced on this center section. But we will see what happens. Okay, so far so good, not bottoming out just yet. Okay, here we go, we're getting to our, our tire lift scenario. Okay, and there it is just there. We have a wheel off the ground. So I'm going to roll out of the brake now and onto the throttle. actually amazing. I'm actually in a bit of shock at the moment because that literally just walked through there without any issues at all. Like it didn't really bottom out, the clearance was adequate and the tyres just spun up as they should and it progressed through without any problems. So a bit shocked by this. <laughs> Good job Ford. Okay it was impressive there but I think Log Mountain will unsettle the escape. I can already feel on the way up here it's starting to scrabble for traction. The suspension is bloody firm as well. Okay, there is our ridge. Let's see how she goes. Put a bit of throttle in. All right, I'm flat to the board now. Oh, it is edging forward a little bit. Try a bit of steering input. All right, so we just got an error message there. All wheel drive temporarily disabled. I could just feel it sending all torque to the front. So obviously we've overheated that or it's it's unimpressed with itself. So I'm gonna go back down. We'll do this again with a little bit of momentum once that error clears and we will try one more time. Okay, I've just restarted the car. Let's give this another shot this time with a touch more momentum. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, the ride is bloody firm. It's just throwing it about everywhere and I have a feeling that's probably going to ultimately stop it from progressing. All right, there we go, we finally made it. It just needed momentum, uh, but yeah, not a very durable all-wheel drive system.
Now, the CRV, it's, um, I think it could be the only SUV here that doesn't actually have an off-road mode per se. So I've just put the off-road screen on there ahead of the driver. We'll see if that does anything. Uh, and we may have to disable traction control if it does end up getting stuck. But we will see how we go. All right, let's start pushing through. I'm looking out the window because I've got a spotter there and um, he's keeping an eye on everything for me to make sure we don't rip the front end off any of these cars and he looks very concerned as we're driving through here so it must be quite low down to the front there all right we're almost at our center section here to test rigidity there we are we're teetering just there yeah that feels fine so rigidity good let's try and truck onto this next section i can see the all-wheel drive system display there is actually doing stuff which is cool all right so far so good so this uses a CVT, so it's a slightly different gearbox technology to some of the cars. I think CVT should actually work better here because it is able to flare up easier. It doesn't have gear shifts to manage and all that kind of thing. All right, so far so good. We're about to pop out the other edge here. We'll see if an off-road mode actually makes any difference at all. Okay, here we go. Teetering. There it is there, we're up. So I can see the traction control light flashing. I'm going to let off the brake and we'll see how it performs making lots of noises, so traction control is operating. I can feel it trying to get us out of here. I'll put some more throttle on. Look at that, so it's sending all the torque to the rear. You can see it there on the display. Yeah, we're not getting anywhere here. My foot is basically flat on the throttle. No, we're not getting anywhere, so I might just try with a little bit more pace. And a bit of steering lock. All right, there we go. We, oh, we're almost out. All right, we made it out. So, yeah, look, technically this, I guess, passed, but it struggled very badly trying to get out of there. So, uh, yeah, not the best system, and I suspect that comes down to no off-road mode. It's not really designed to do any of this stuff, but, um, yeah, it got there in the end. It just needed a little bit of persistence. Let's try Log Mountain now. We'll see how it fares. So the ride's good, it's nice and gentle up here, which I like. Get it over our ridge. Oh, there it is there. Let's see how we go. So, put on the throttle. That all-wheel drive display is showing us what's going on. It is literally doing nothing. It's just making a whole lot of sound. Nothing is happening. Now, given this doesn't have an all-wheel drive mode, I'm gonna try turning traction control off just to see if that makes any difference. Here we go. Actually, it feels like it doesn't have enough power to get us above the ridge. So this is the only car so far that we've tested that really doesn't even have enough grunt to move it off that mark, let alone sw slip a wheel. So, all right, we'll try that again. So that's a, a fail for that ridge test. I'll try it again just with a little bit more momentum. It should, in theory, make it up here without any problems, but uh, we won't know until we try it. There were no four-wheel drive error messages either, which is good. So here we go, take two. All right, tiny bit more momentum. Oh, it is really struggling. Um, no, we'll get, uh, all right, we're almost there. There we are, mate, okay. So look, it did make it, but it was not very glamorous. And um, yeah, it just didn't even have enough power to get over the ridge while we were stationary, so. Yeah, look, I, I don't think this is built for off-roading. There are no off-road modes, so this is probably just a car best kept inside the city. Okay, time for the Havel H6. So this is one of two cars that we have on test with a dual clutch transmission. So I think that's probably gonna affect these the most because it, it is kind of, it's not like a torque converter which can slip. This is either on or off effectively, and then it does slip in between a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna put it into off-road mode. So let's give that a shot. This is also the lowest in terms of ground clearance. So there is a good chance we won't be able to get very far, but we'll see how we go. I can already hear it scraping and Scott's face is telling uh, an interesting tale. Uh, okay, we're getting to the middle section now, which is our body rigidity test. All right, so far so good, here it comes. Okay, and there's our little teeter spot just there. Let's see how this goes. 
That opens and closes without any dramas at all. Very good. Let's move on. Hopefully we get through and don't get stuck. Yeah, with having the least ground clearance here, it's probably going to be its biggest hurdle, but I'm hoping that it can work through that. And we don't end up getting it beached as we move through the water here. Oh, that feels so low. All right, we've made it so far. All right, we're about to kick the wheel up to see how it deals with this loss of traction. Here we go. All right. Oh, I can't even... Oh, see now that's not good. It's got like a massive clunk as I roll onto the throttle. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it got through, but it struggled a lot, and there were a lot of clunks coming from what felt like the transmission. Yeah, it's really hard to describe. It was while I was applying throttle, it just started clunking a lot. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that was the uh, the actual transmission itself or the all-wheel drive system. So, yeah, a bit of a mixed feel on that. It got through there in the end, but it really did feel like it struggled once the going got a little bit tough. So it was a little underwhelming on the moguls, but let's see how it goes here on Log Mountain. All right, coming through. Rested just there. Okay, I'm just gonna get on the throttle. We'll see how it goes. Oh, look at that. That walked up, that was no drama. So I did get that same massive knock through the body as I was coming up there. I think that's something to do with the transmission. Don't know, but it got up there. That was really good. Once it sorted itself out, it didn't flare up. It just got up there, so that's actually really surprising. I'm pretty impressed by that. I wasn't expecting it to be able to overcome that little lip, so pretty impressive there from the Havel H6. Time for the Tiguan. So this is the other of the two cars with a dual clutch, but this has an off-road mode, so I'm gonna flick over to that now. Off-road mode is activated. And then I'll put the off-road stuff on the screen here so you can see that you can kind of flick between those different menus. Nothing really too useful there. Um, so let's see how this goes with our off-road mode active. This is a pretty sporty car, so I fear that this is also going to bottom out a little bit because it's got a nice looking front lip on it. All right, here we go. Just watching Scott again as he panics as I come through. Okay, here we go, we're coming to our middle section for rigidity. This platform has been out a little while, so let's see how this goes. No dramas at all. Yeah, very impressive. So, very impressed by that. Let us move on. Okay, here we go. I'm going to kill the parking sensors. As we get panicked looks. Yeah, the body kit on this is really low, so that's why I was convinced that it would be bottoming out. I haven't heard anything just yet, though, so I guess it's sporty and functional as a four-wheel drive. Right, here we go. We're coming up to our little mogul here. Let's see how it performs. We throw a wheel up. There it is, just there. So we've got a wheel off the ground. Let's see how it goes. Foot is off the brake. I'll roll onto the throttle now. A little bit more throttle. Seems good. No dramas there. It's actually quite an impressive system. That's the parking sensors coming back on. Um, yeah, it's a pretty impressive system because it's not, you know, the dual clutch isn't slowing it down or affecting it. Uh, it actually just gives you the progressive torque that you need to move the car. And then when the wheel was up in the air, it actually felt like it was moving on its own steed. It was braking as required. Uh, I'm actually pretty impressed by this, given how old this platform is. It actually seemed to perform its job pretty well. So, yeah, good job by the Tiguan. Let's try Log Mountain now. See if our run of success with the Tiguan continues. Yeah, this off-road mode seems to actually be doing a pretty decent job. Get it up to our little section. Uh, there, okay. Here we go. So I'm going to load up the throttle and progressively apply more and more. It's biting, it's actually... Get up there, it doesn't look like we're going to make it up. No, no bingo. Okay, back we go. I keep getting errors about lane assist and it's because on, on the steering here, I keep tapping it 
It's the, I really don't like these buttons on the Tiguan. They're quite frustrating. Uh, but in other news, the hill descent control works in reverse, which is good news. So a big tick there for hill descent control in reverse. All right, take two, just with a little bit more momentum. It is good to see that despite staying in it for as long as I did, it didn't throw up any transmission or all wheel drive warnings. And then second time around, just by going with a bit more momentum, it got up there without any dramas. So yeah, look, it's, um, it's interesting. The off-road mode actually works, so it does a good job there. Um, the only downside is that it's just not quite well sorted enough to get it over that lip, and I think part of that could be the transmission. The dual clutch just isn't really the best transmission for proper off-road driving, and that's where a torque converter is going to excel. But outside of that, it did a pretty good job. X-Trail time. Now, this is the only one here that can do two-wheel drive dedicated auto or four-wheel drive lock. So I'm gonna put it into the four-wheel drive lock mode. It's come up with a message there saying that it's locked. Let's get it set up on our seesaw for flex. There it is, just there. No dramas. This is the oldest platform here. And um, yeah, no issues there with body rigidity, which is good. So let's move on. So far, so good. Try not to smash the GoPro into the ledge there. Okay, here we go for our little uh, offset mogul section. Okay, so wheel is up in the air just there. So I'm gonna roll off the brake again and into the throttle. Yeah, it's getting there, it's getting there, come on. Wood is hard on the throttle now. There we go, got there in the end. So it took a little bit of motivation, but once the traction control came on, it pushed it over the edge and it was really fuss free. I think um, one of the advantages of the CVT is that it's able to just give you that little bit of extra flair without having to fuss around with gears. So that seemed to work okay. It was a little hesitant, but once I gave it more throttle, it kind of powered through. It didn't feel like it touched down anywhere either. So um, X-Trail, I guess it's a, a tried and true favorite. Log Mountain o'clock. Let's give this a shot. All right, so the ride feels good. Liking that. Get up to our little section just there. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna bury the foot, well, gradually put the uh, throttle on and then we'll see what happens. Slipping a little bit. Uh, gone flat to the floor now. It's just kicking us sideways. It's not actually really getting us up there. Try just a little bit more throttle. It feels like it's about to get there, but no, I'm gonna stop there. So yeah, look, no uh, all-wheel drive system overheating, but it really did struggle to move anywhere beyond just slipping the wheels. So even in that four-wheel drive mode, it just basically kept uh, spinning the wheels and didn't really give it us any progress. So let's try that again. This time I'll just have a tiny bit more momentum. Okay, here we go. This time a bit more momentum. progress there. Yeah, no drivers. So all it needed was a bit of momentum. Um, it's interesting, this is naturally aspirated and it had enough power to get over that ridge and, and start spinning the wheels, whereas the Honda sort of just didn't really do anything. So yeah, look, I think once this is moving, it's fine. It's not the most advanced system in the world and there doesn't appear to be an actual off-road mode to take advantage of the four-wheel drive lock feature, but um, it kind of just does the job. So that was a stack of fun. We've come back to the office to analyze the results. And before we get into the results, I thought I'd call out that we checked all of the tire pressures on the cars and made the tire pressures exactly what the manufacturer recommends. And I understand that obviously if you select different tires or put Meteor off-road tires, some of these are going to be more capable than others, but we stuck with factory tires and factory pressures just to make sure everything was nice and consistent. Now let's talk ground clearance. I was actually pretty surprised by this. We had everything from the Havel H6, which was not very good in terms of ground clearance, all the way through the Jeep Compass, which dominated. And you can see on the screen there, the comparison between the vehicles. It may not seem like much, but ground clearance is ultimately what you need to be able to go over a lot of these obstacles. And uh, certainly when you get to slightly tougher terrain, ground clearance will ultimately stop you if you don't have enough there. But there is another story to tell, and we noticed this with the Tiguan, that even though it had an okay ground clearance, it was let down by body kit. So it kind of scraped a little bit when we were doing 
doing some of the stuff on that offset mogul. And some of the other cars also had these uh, lips beneath the actual body kit that scraped a little there. Kind of sacrificial, so you can give them a whack if you need to. And in addition to that, do you really need all-wheel drive? Well, we hit the mogul in the X Trail in two-wheel drive mode to make sure our course was challenging enough for a medium SUV. And as you can see, it didn't really get very far. It ended up getting stuck on the moguls and even on the logs, it couldn't make it to the first obstacle when it was in two-wheel drive. So if you are buying and wondering whether you should spend on an all-wheel drive system, even the poorer performing all-wheel drive systems will at least get you somewhere instead of getting you completely stuck. Let's talk about our standouts first, and I think the first I want to call out is the Tucson. It was really fascinating because the Sportage over the exact same terrain performed kind of the same, but when it got to the logs, it overheated its all-wheel drive system, whereas the Tucson, on the other hand, it just climbed up and there were no complaints there about the all-wheel drive system. So I don't know if there's a slightly different calibration given they do share the same platform, but the Tucson appeared to be a little bit more capable and the all-wheel drive system a little bit more robust when it came to that constant and gradual load on our logs. The other one that impressed was the Havel. So despite having such little ground clearance, it did an okay job on the moguls. It did have that knocking sound from the dual clutch, but I thought the dual clutch would ultimately stop it from progressing on our logs because dual clutch is kind of nothing or everything, but in actual fact, it helped it get up the logs by giving it just that little bit more traction. And then the traction control system then prevented it from flaring up and spinning its wheels. And it really just climbed up pretty impressively, I thought, for what shouldn't have got all that far given ground clearance and dual clutch transmission. Uh, the Outlander as well, I think it's worth calling out that that made it up the logs. It was another one that instead of just flaring up and spinning the wheels, it did everything nice and gradually. And look, it doesn't have a turbo charge, so it doesn't really have the opportunity to just send this huge pulse of torque to the wheels. But the advantage that it had with its CVT was that it was able to control things gradually and then allowed the traction control system and the all-wheel drive system to take care of the rest. And it did show that while it had limited progression in the moguls, when it got to the logs, it was able to do everything nice and smoothly and get all the way up to the top without having to go back down again. And the Ford Escape, look, it did overheat the all-wheel drive system when we got to our logs, but I thought when it was on the offset moguls, it did a really good job of progressing through without any problems. It basically just did everything it needed to do with its traction control that allowed it to just pulse all the way through and Bob's your uncle had got through the mobile without any dramas at all. Perhaps a slightly more robust all-wheel drive system will help with things like the logs in the future. Now let's get on to our disappointments and look I'm going to bundle all the cars that had overheating all-wheel drive systems. I, I genuinely think it's unacceptable because that log climb was pretty basic and we weren't on the throttle all that long. It really should have been a case of them being able to cope with that kind of load on the all-wheel drive system for slightly longer. We really weren't putting them under too much stress. So I don't know whether it was just an artificial limit that said, hey, something's not working with the all-wheel drive system, go back, or whether we were actually overheating it and it needed to stop so that it could have another shot. So it's pretty disappointing. There were quite a few cars in that box. The Honda CRV as well, I mean, it just got absolutely nowhere. It didn't even have enough power to rotate any of its wheels while it was sitting on the logs. So um, obviously this stuff is very much light off-roading, but I think Honda probably needs to work on that for the next generation of the CRV. And the other one I want to call out as well is the RAV4. In theory, that should have been the best performer here, but it really was inconsistent when it came to the moguls and also the logs. It just spun up the front wheels for some bizarre reason. It wasn't really doing anything with the rear axle. It's a vehicle that can use its electric motor at the rear axle to just do what it needs to do instantly without having to worry about the drive line and delays between shuffling torque. So I think Toyota really needs to work on trail mode in the RAV4 to just give it that edge, part of the pun, over the rest of the competitors. But I think undoubtedly the biggest disappointment here was the Jeep Compass. I mean, this carries a trail rated badge and while it did great during the uh, offset mogul section, it performed incredibly poorly with the door flex. So we weren't able to shut the door, well, we could shut the door, but we had to slam it and it was really just pushing metal on metal. So the body isn't quite rigid enough for that basic off-roading. Then in addition to that, of all the cars, I would expect this to not have uh, all-wheel drive system issues when it's trying to climb pretty basic terrain like the logs there. So. Yeah, I think the trail rated badge on the Jeep Compass, I don't know how much testing they actually did on it, but um, it really didn't cope all that well with our very basic off-road course. And that brings us to the winner. This one probably surprised me a bit. The Subaru Forester has a heritage as an off-road vehicle. Earlier versions of the Forester were 
very much so off-road capable. But this new Forester really just does everything very well when it comes to light off-roading. So the all-wheel drive system, it's permanently active. When it came to the moguls, it was able to get through there without any fuss at all. The X mode settings feel like they actually make a difference. There was no issue with the flex test. And then when we got to the logs, I just leaned on the throttle and it got up there without any problems at all. So the Subaru Forester is ultimately the best choice in this segment if you need a family car to do your family duties day to day, but also a car that's capable of doing very light off-roading in that scenario that we threw at it. So congratulations to Subaru with the Forester. It really is a fantastic light off-road vehicle. Now this test was all about basic off-roading. Did we miss anything? Is there anything that we could have done better? Let me know in the comments section below. If you did enjoy the video, please make sure you like it and share it with your mates. We're currently planning future versions of this type of content and I want to be led by you in terms of what we produce. So do you do you want to see dual cab utes? Do you want to see bigger SUVs go through our light off-road course? Let me know in the comments section below. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.